whatever you do for note taking, get that ready right now because this is one of the most interesting articles you could ever come across. This is about Marcion being the one who put Paul basically in the New Testament. Dr. Badoon doesn't in this in this article talk about Marcion as being you know the son of Satan. I'm connecting the dots because Polycarp, early church father Polycarp, disciple of the original disciple John, is the one who said that Marcion is the son of Satan, child of the devil. A few other church fathers as well harshly condemned Marcion for being full of the devil or full of evil spirits, uh, speaking as, as if the evil spirits was all over his tongue, like all kinds of things. So I'm just saying, hey, Polycarp calls him the son of Satan. So this is what I always think of when I, when I see or read or think about Marcion. I think about, about those things. Here it is. The fourth R, volume 27, number five. This is the September to October 2014 edition. Marcion. This is the first article of this of this particular document. I think this is like this is basically like a book or booklet. Like there's what? How many pages here? 32 pages. I believe this is like eight and a half by 11 pages. Like, you know, anyways, um, the first one by Jason David Badoon, Marcion, Forgotten Church Father and inventor of the New Testament. Isn't that interesting? So let's go on here, see what it says. The first generations of Christians formed diverse local groups with several distinctly different understandings of their experience of Jesus Christ and divergent in interpretations of the meaning of his instruction. In the words of B.H. Streeter, there was no unifying authority, no worldwide organization, however informal, to check the independent development of the various local churches each on its own lines. The early church, so to speak, the early centuries, it was just all over the place. Uh, doctrines, beliefs, uh, experience, um, it was just all over the place. There was nothing really to unify or there was nothing really to oversee doctrine and all that kind of stuff. These local Christian communities had a complex relationship to the broader Jewish community itself diverse within which they first developed okay so this is basically what i talk about all the time you know book of acts kind of so-called christianity if you will whether you want to call it christianity or the way or messianic whatever you want to call it uh judaism jewish community that's the roots of of the real deal which passed through a series of violent uprisings against the roman order in 66 to 70 115 to 117 and 132 to 134 CE or AD with each successive wave of Jewish restiveness and anti-Jewish repression local Christian communities would have been faced with fundamental questions of identity and association with respect to the Jewish roots of their faith they fell under social and cultural pressure from without for their links to Jewish identity from within for their nonconformity to newly emerging Jewish orthodoxies. Onto this scene stepped Marcion. Here we go. Enter, enter Marcion, okay? So Badoon, Dr. Badoon painted the picture for us. This is the kind of culture, this is the kind of scene that Marcion sprung up in. Following what he believed to be the views of Paul. Here we go, here we go. Uh, he pushed for a clean break, a break with Jewish religious tradition. So it seems to me that whatever Paul meant, wherever he stood, whether he was, as most Christians believe he was, anti-Torah, yada, 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 whatever the case is, it seems like Marcion is, is really the first one, apart from Paul himself, perhaps, that really started this break this, what I call the greatest schism, right, between real Christians and the Jews, Judaism, the greatest schism. When we had the two that became one, so to speak, and now they split. Badun goes on to say, Marcion applied his intellectual and organizational gifts to working out a resolution of the troubled relationship between the parent religious culture and its wayward offspring. 
If Paul was correct that the message of Christ ultimately transcended the boundaries of the Mosaic Covenant, thank you, Mr. Badoon, for saying if Paul was correct, um, what role remained for Jewish scriptures that enjoined, celebrated, and promoted that covenant? And in those scriptures, if those scriptures were obsolete, as this line of understanding might be taken to imply, where could one look for authoritative guidance? What were to be the distinctly Christian scriptures? Okay, so the search for true Christianity, basically. Here we go. Who was Marcion? The historical role of Marcion at this crucial turning point in the development of Christianity has been obscured by his traditional reputation as a heretic. Later, Christianity traced itself back in hindsight, to certain views among the great variety expressed by early Christians. Theological propositions such as Marcion's that had not been adopted into that so-called orthodoxy were branded as heretical, literally sectarian, or not going along with the majority opinion. Of course, this entire way of looking at Christian history was anachronistic, since it judged Marcion's time by opinions that only became the majority view much later. Hmm. It seems like Dr. Berdoun is saying, okay, Marcion was condemned for these views, but the church actually adopted these views over time itself. The church itself adopted these views. Okay, so Marcion shared with most Christians of his time the idea from the teachings of Jesus that there was something fundamentally wrong with a world full of violence and injustice, where the wicked prospered and the innocent suffered. Many Christians before Marcion, including Paul, had understood this to mean that God was not in direct, immediate control of the world, but that through Jesus, he was announcing a plan to intervene in the world's affairs and save those who wished to be rescued. Marcion saw a fairly stark contrast between this Christian God and the portrayal of God in the Jewish scriptures, and he concluded that the God of Moses was not the God of Jesus. For Marcion, the God of the quote-unquote Old Testament, was part of the problematic character of this world, not the source of the solution brought by Jesus. Like, the way the church thinks of it now, it's not maybe exactly that way, but kind of. It's like, well, no, we don't go by the Torah anymore. We don't go by the, you know, that's, you know, that, that's too harsh for us. We go, by Je we go by Jesus and grace and faith and all this kind of stuff. It's kind of Marcionistic in that sense, isn't it? Says Marcion was far from alone in this opinion among Marcion's followers and various communities of so called Gnostic Christians. Gnostic. According to Dr. Price, Paul was like the father of the Gnostics. The Gnostics considered Paul to be their apostle, just like Marcion considers Paul to be his apostle. It was probably the majority opinion in the second century. I believe that by the time the, the end of the first century rolled around, there has already been a great deal of falling away, departing from the true doctrine and faith of Yeshua. By the time you get into the second century, then you get into a lot of this stuff. Like not everybody, like the shepherd of Hermas, I think is great, but you got like some of these early church fathers are not so good, not so good in the sense that they are very anti-Jewish, anti-Torah, just say the least. Again, not all of them, but too many of them. Let's put it that way. Uh, eventually, however, most Christians found enough er, continuities between the teachings of Jesus and the Jewish scriptures to conclude that the same God stood behind both and that Marcion had overemphasized the differences. But it was not enough simply to say that Marcion's th theological views had not prevailed. It became habitual to accuse him and all other heretics of bad motives, of deliberately misleading people into error. Why else would they have resisted quote-unquote truth so stubbornly and defended their own conclusions till their dying breath? With this frame of mind, later Christians quite naturally found it difficult to accept that Marcion had contributed anything positive to making Christianity what it had become. That is why it takes a neutral historical perspective to recover the story of Marcion as a key figure in his own time and to identify the lasting impact he had on Christianity, not through his theological views, but rather from the more practical innovations he contributed to the Christian community life. 
Marcion came from the Roman province of Pontus of what is today the north coast of Turkey. He began in the sea trade as a shipmaster or ship owner. His profession may be the most significant thing we know about him personally. Ships were the fastest and most effective means of communication and transport of goods in the Roman Empire. Through the organization of his business, Marcion would have had agents or contacts in many major ports throughout the empire and would have visited these far-flung places for business reasons. This would have given him a tremendous advantage when it came to spreading his message rapidly and organizing communities on an empire-wide scale. Those engaged in the sea trade were one of the only segments of the population to have channels of communication independent of government control. The role they may have played in spreading Christianity might remain, for now, mostly speculation, but it may be pertinent to note that precisely at the time when Marcion was active, the Roman government found it necessary to issue laws against admitting people who were not actually involved in the sea trade into membership in, in its professional associations. That may suggest that the latter were being employed for some sort of networking beyond the original purpose of such associations. We do not know if Marcion was born into the Christian movement or converted to it. We have no way of knowing whether he was raised in a Christian community already disconnected from its Jewish roots, later joined to a community, or was himself an innovator in that direction. In fact, the whole question of just how distinctly Christianity had become from Judaism by Marcion's time is very actively debated today. The first Christians were Jews, and the first non-Jewish Christians almost certainly came from the so-called God-fearers, Gentiles, who attended Jewish synagogues as a kind of affiliated community of fans, so to speak, of the Jewish religious traditions. The Christian movement crossed into Gentile awareness from its Jewish roots through this medium, as we can see from some of the letters of Paul and the book of Acts. What then happened when, through a, a series of socio-political crises, the dependence of these Gentile Christian groups on a Jewish Christian core became untenable and Gentile Christians either willingly or unwillingly went their own way? The Jewish War of 66 to 70 CE or AD, the Jewish urban insurgencies and anti-Jewish riots of 116 to 117 AD, then the Bar Kokhba rebellion of 132 to 134 CE or AD, repeatedly made association with Jews very problematic. Each of those wars was followed by decades of anti-Jewish laws and social prejudice. Jewish religion itself went through traumatic adjustments that made it less tolerant of dissident groups like the Christians. As the Gentile Christian groups detached from the synagogue, they developed in different directions. Some led toward Marcion, in which the Jewish background of Christian thought and practice was minimized. Others led toward what Marcion encountered in Rome, where Gentile Christians felt entitled to appropriate the Jewish tradition as a whole and to claim to be Verus Israel, the true Israel. Marcion may have grown up in a Gentile Christian community already substantially detached from its Jewish roots. We have a rare source of information on the state of Christianity in the Bithynia Pontus region at the time when Marcion would have been a young man there. In a letter from the Roman governor Pliny to the emperor Trajan around 112 AD, Pliny considered Christianity, quote, a depraved and extravagant superstition, unquote, which apparently had been present in the area for as long as 20 years. Under interrogation, some of the Christians provided Pliny with an account of their religious observances. So it says, on an appointed day, they had been accustomed to meet before daybreak and to recite a hymn antiphonally to Christ as to a God and to bind themselves by an oath not for the commission of any crime, but to abstain from theft, robbery, adultery, and breach of faith, and not to deny a deposit when it was claimed. 
after the conclusion of this ceremony, it was their custom to depart and meet again to take food. But it was ordinary and harmless food. What is striking about this description is that it sounds like a garden variety Greco-Roman cultic association. Pliny's report lacks any reference or resemblance to Jewish religious practice. If this community saw itself as Jewish, Pliny certainly would have said so. We also miss any reference to the Jewish scriptures or to any written texts, which we would expect to have caught Pliny's attention as a source of information on the secretive group. Marcion's Christian conflict. Eventually, Marcion made his way to Rome, probably early in the reign of the empire Antoninus, Pius, that would be 138 to 161 AD, at which time he sought communion with the established Christian communities there. Yet his understanding of Christianity differed enough from that of the Roman Christian leaders that they could not tolerate each other. Sources report arguments over the significance of such things as Jesus' analogy of the old and new wineskins, it's in Luke 5, 36 to 37, reflecting questions of how the new Christian movement should relate to the older Jewish tradition. Marcion framed a series of contrasts, antitheses, between God and values found in Jewish scriptures and those represented in the teachings of Jesus. A few informative fragments of this lost work survive, such as the following. It says in the law, quote, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, unquote. But the Lord, because he is good, says in the gospel, if anyone should strike you on the cheek, turn the other one to him, Luke 6, 29. The prophet of the God of creation, when war came upon the people, went up to the top of the mountain and stretched out his hands to God so that he might destroy many in, the, in battle. Yet our Lord, because he is good, stretched out his hands not to destroy, but to save men. So where is the similarity? One, by stretching out his hands, destroys, the other, the other saves. The creator at Elijah's demand brings down a plague of fire upon the false prophet, and on the contrary, Christ reproves the disciples when they call for the same punishment upon the village of, of the Samaritans. The God of creation says, I make the rich and poor, whereas Jesus says, blessed are you poor. And Whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. From such contrasts of value, Marcion went on to identify other apparent contradictions that suggest that Jesus' God was not the same God as the God of Jewish tradition. The Creator was known to Adam as his contemporaries that is made known in the Scriptures. And to Ezekiel, he says, I was known to your fathers in the wilderness, but the Father of Christ is unknown just as Christ himself declared when he said of him, no one knew the Father except the Son, neither does anyone know the Son except the Father, Luke 10, 22. Marcion concluded that the creator of this world was a lower divine being and that human beings are all children of a lesser God, rescued by an all-good and benevolent higher God who sent Jesus as the mediator of salvation from the harsh commands and expectations and almost certain damnation uh, as sinners reflected in the Old Testament. Marcion became the organizer and leader of a separate Christian community that rapidly drew in adherents from across the Roman Empire. These Marcionite Christian churches were categorized by celibacy among baptized initiates, pacifism, and pesco-vegetarianism, and they offered up their share of martyrs in the persecutions that periodically swept over the Christian movement. They were also unique in having something no other Christian community had in the mid-2nd century, a canon of Christian scriptures. Here we go. Now we're into the canon of Christian scriptures. It's like this is where the canon began, especially the canon of the New Testament. Marcion's invention of the New Testament. Here we are. Many modern Christians think of the New Testament as a book outside of history. Let me say that again. Many modern Christians think of the New Testament as a book outside of history. Something that was just suddenly there. <laughs> it, just, it just happened. And the Holy Spirit told me. It just happened. Historians of Christianity though able to trace its gradual, gradual authorship and formation, 
nonetheless typically find themselves describing the composition and collection of New Testament writings as an anonymous process. Isn't that something? Historians of Christianity, though able to trace its gradual authorship and formation, nonetheless typically find themselves describing the composition and collection of New Testament writings as an anonymous process. A spontaneous evolution accomplished by the nameless and faceless members of ancient communities of faith. Thank you very much, Dr. Badoon. My heart is just exploding here, okay? How many times do we talk to Christians? It's like, well, how do you know? Like, Paul's in the New Testament, so how do you know he should be there? Well, because the Holy Spirit told me. Well, well, how do you know that's the Holy Spirit? How do you know? How do you know? Like, I mean, seriously, I'm not trying to be, you know, I mean, seriously, like, I don't want to just accept something just because somebody feels like it should be there. I want to know the truth here. I believe God is the God of truth, right? And so it seems to me that the New Testament evolved, for lack of a better word, evolved from nameless, faceless, as Dr. Padoon says, nameless, faceless, anonymous people that nobody even knows who they were. Now, does that mean that what's in it is, is all wrong? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that the actual canon of it should not be trusted as purely from God because we have no evidence that it is. Like who, not even, uh, who out of all these people that were involved in the composition and collection of the books that we have in the New Testament, who even claimed to be led by God in doing so? Who even claimed to have instruction, direction, dictation from God to do so? It seems like it was just like <laughs> Joe Blow's idea, John Henry's idea, just, hey, let's just put a, a bunch of books together and that'll be our little New Testament, you know? What books do you want? Well, I don't know, John, what do you think? I don't know, what do you think, Joe? Well, I'll just, well, I like Paul, or whatever the case. I like this one, I like that one. You know, and you, you look at the different Bibles, especially the earlier Bibles, like like Conax Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus. It's like different books, different books. So it took a while to actually get what we got today, but let's let's continue. But when it comes to the origin, there, here we go. We're getting into the meat of it here. When it comes to the origin of the New Testament, we know the name of the individual responsible. The New Testament that we have today was put together by anonymous people that nobody even knows who they were. But the origin of the New Testament, in other words, how it started, not the entirety of like, the finished, not like the master copy or the finished work, but the origin of it, said, according to Benun, he makes the bold claim here. He says, we know the name of the individual responsible for the origin of the New Testament. The circumstances of his work in compiling it. So we know the name of the individual responsible. The circumstances of his work in compiling it. And even a date that bears some relation to his momentous decision to establish a textual foundation for the fledging Christian communities of his time, 144 AD. Wow. Marcion defined for the first time a biblical canon. Wait a second. Say that again. But Marcion defined for the first time a biblical canon. Let that sink in for a moment. Marcion defined for the first time a Bible canon. Now, personally, Marcion's doctrine I find quite repulsive. I think that it's absolutely horrific. <laughs> my, own, my own opinion of it. Uh, Marcion's anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, anti-Torah stand and total, I, I, do, I, I do agree with almost every other church father out there and, and, and everybody else in that time, he definitely, he, he's definitely in error to say the least. 
again, you got Justin Martyr saying that he had evil spirits on his tongue. Polycarp, the disciple of the disciple John, saying that Marcion was a son of Satan. And it's this man, this man, who was the one, he was the one, the first one to devise a Bible canon. In other words, he's the first one to actually put together a Bible. Because before that, as far as I understand, each book of the Tanakh especially was kept separately. And then all of the letters of Paul and all the other, th- all the other books of the New Testament were, were all scattered everywhere. There, there was no Bible canon. There was no Bible. There was no Bible. It was just, hey... The letter of Paul to the to to the Galatians is in Galatia. <laughs> the letter of Paul, you know, it's like it's all over the place. But this is amazing. Marcion defined for the first time a biblical canon. That is, in the useful distinction made by Bruce Metzger, not just a collection of authoritative books, such as a circulating set of Pauline letters, but an authoritative collection of books wow which sets limits that clearly signaled a unique status for the texts included so marcion was the one according to dr badoon marcion was the one who started this whole bible canon idol business the bible is in nor- inerrant all authoritative word of god so marcion was the one that started this. Wow. Dr. Badoon says, Marcion clearly intended his first testament to serve as the touchstone of Christian belief and practice at a time when these were still quite fluid and conveyed in a primarily oral environment. Before Marcion, there were Christian writings that were read and treated as being, in some sense, in some sense authoritative, but they had limited local circulation and were not, were not incorporated into a larger Bible. Traditions about Jesus were known, recounted, and recorded. The readers of these records regarded them as accurate, informed, perhaps even inspired. But the impetus to collect them into either a distinct scripture or a supplement to the Jewish one simply had not arisen. In quite a few places, the majority of texts that would ultimately be included in the New Testament were completely unknown. Can you imagine? Like living in the early 2nd century and much of the New Testament is still unknown. I would love to hear from somebody who believes that the Bible is, is, is God's word, all authoritative, in, you know, inerrant, uh, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards. I would love to, I'd love to ask them a question. Why would God, if what you believe is true, Christian, that the Bible in its 66 book framework is, is it? Why would God wait over a hundred years many 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 people living and dying in that time before there was even a new testament canon and why would he why marcion this is not like you know peter or james the just made it that would be a holy that'd be a totally different story we got marcion doing this not peter not john not even doubting Thomas, but we have Marcion doing this. For those who consider the Jewish scriptures as authoritative as ever, the growing set of new writings may have been seen as secondary, subordinate body of literature. Marcion's perspective, from whom the the Jewish scriptures were theologically and ethically problematic, that's, that's a red flag right there. So, from Marcion's perspective, the Torah is problematic. And from Marcion's perspective, the Jews are ethically problematic? Like, what? Something's not right there, that's for sure. Something's not right there. 
Marcion's perspective, for whom the Jewish scriptures were theologically and ethically problematic, prompted him to raise the stakes on this amorphous body of early Christian literature to the point of elevating some of it to a unique status of authority. And so it was that for the first time in history, Marcion collected an authoritative set of Christian writings intended to be afforded a status above that of other Christian literature. The discomfort that many today have with Marcion's role in this decisive event of Christian history needs to be dealt with. By later standards of orthodoxy, Marcion's interpretation of the New Testament writings was heretical. But that is a completely separate matter from the value of his New Testament text and its importance for the later Christian tradition. This distinction often has not been appreciated. Thus, one of the principal tasks of my book, The First New Testament, is to demonstrate why it should be made and how much more significant the Marcionite New Testament becomes as a consequence. Marcion's New Testament consisted of two parts. The Evangelion, a narrative account of the teachings and deeds of Jesus related literarily to the gospel we now know as Luke. And the Apostolicon, a collection of 10 letters of Paul. Those very 10, incidentally, that modern critical scholarship has concluded to have the greatest likelihood of being authentic. That is amazing. That is amazing. So what, what Dr. Badun is saying here is that the first New Testament, the first New Testament, the original New Testament was made by Marcion, which included literarily the Gospel of Luke and 10 of the, the epistles of Paul, most of which scholars today concur that those are the authentic letters of Paul, whereas the other ones are debatable and some completely reject them as being authentic. So in the New Testament today, the modern New Testament, we have 13 letters of Paul, only seven of which is considered to be authentic by most scholars. The other six, many scholars say, hey, it's not Paul. Marcion lived around the same time as Paul. I mean, just after the, the in, uh, in the second century, just after the, the life of Paul, more or less. And he should know, he should know which, which epistles were authentic. And he had the 10 epistles of Paul. Of course, there's the, much of which are the seven that we have today, plus a few of the other ones that we don't have in the, in the New Testament today. I believe uh, the, uh, Paul's epistle to the Laodiceans was one of them, which Marcion seemed to believe that he had evidence that that was authentic. Moving on. We have some reason to think that he adopted the latter from the existing set compiled by some unknown collector of Paul's letters. But Marcion is, in fact, our earliest witness to the existence of six of those ten letters, 2 Corinthians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Notice, Galatians is not there. Okay, let's move on here. By elevating a set of letters of Paul to parity with, with an account of the life and teachings of Jesus himself, Marcion put his distinctive stamp on all subsequent attempts to formalize a New Testament. That decision puts Marcion's work in a direct line of continuity with the later Christian New Testaments. Thus, not only the idea of a New Testament can be credited first to Marcion, but also the distinctive structure of that New Testament combining a gospel narrative of the life of Jesus with the apostolic letters, specifically the letters of Paul. Not just the idea of a New Testament, as, a, as opposed to the Old Testament, not just that idea, but also the structure of the New Testament in that we have the gospel account, and then we have, we have a much, uh, most of it is uh, the epistles of Paul. That's from Marcion. 
That's Marcionistic. There is little to be said in favor of the claim that the formation of the New Testament followed an inevitable trajectory that the Christian Bible would have turned out exactly as it did even if Marcion had never lived. In other words, if somebody brings the, um, the claim that, well, we would have had the New Testament anyway, whether it was through Marcion or not, you know, because somehow it would have happened. There's, there's nothing or little to be said in favor of that claim. Contrary to the claim, that is, that the New Testament would have come about anyway, even if Marcion never lived. On the contrary, the, the correspondence between what Marcion did and what the New Testament ultimately became in the hands of his triumphant competitors suggests his lasting impact on the Christian Bible and so on Christianity itself. In the time of Marcion, we find few quotations from the books that were to be included in the New Testament. In the first one and a half centuries of the church's history, there is no single gospel writing which is directly made known, named, or in any way given prominence by quotation. Written and oral traditions run side by side or cross, enrich or distort one another, without distinction or even the possibility of distinction between them. We can see a clear difference in how early Christian writers informally handled material later included in the New Testament compared to their more formal, precise citation of Jewish scriptures. The two sources of instruction simply did not share the same level of sacredness and authority for these authors. Marcion's contemporary, Justin Martyr, for instance, made use of a collection of stories and sayings of Jesus called from various gospels, both known and unknown to us today. That's interesting. Hmm. So Justin Martyr, he quoted gospels or stories of Jesus that we don't even know, know or have of. To, we don't even have those stories today. That's pretty interesting. With little indication that he considered it important to preserve the exact wording of anything other than Jesus' own statements. So Justin Martyr gave little indication that he considered it important to preserve the exact wording of anything other than Jesus' own statements. In other words, words in red only, please. Words in red only. Like, not even Paul. By the way, I don't know, I don't think Dr. Badoon uh, mentions it here in his article, but Justin Martyr, he wrote over 400 pages of Christian theology and writing, like Christian writings, and not once, not once did he mention Paul. Like, that's a miracle. <laughs> that's a miracle all by itself because who t you go to a Christian bookstore today, it's like, where is a book that, you, that doesn't mention Paul? But yet there was Justin Martyr with like four, a, a fairly good-sized book, 400-page book, not a mention of Paul. Anyways, a bit earlier, Papias of Heropolis felt free to criticize the sequence of the Gospel of Mark and to prefer oral traditions to written ones generally. We can affirm, therefore, four points of Adolf von Harnock made 90 years ago about Marcion's contribution to the formation of the Christian Bible. Number one, Christians owe to Marcion the idea of a New Testament. Wow. Wow. Say that one. Uh, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get some feathers ruffled. You're going to get some hair standing on end. Yeah, so your new, your new Testament is in existence thanks to Marcion. It had occurred to no one before and can best be understood as originating in the context of Marcion's rejection of an Old Testament base for Christianity. Wow. Wow. Okay, number two. Christians owe to Marcion the particular form of the New Testament. The equal standing of the letters of Paul with the memoirs of Christ's life in something that would be not expected in sacred literature from any president up to that time. Number three, Christians owe to Marcion the prominence of the voice of Paul. <laughs> oh my. I can just hear the Paulians now. Oh yeah, so... Christians owed Marcion the prominence of Paul. 
of the voice of Paul in the New Testament. And consequently, in the subsequent Christian tradition generally. So, the, so basically, the only reason why Paul is so prominent today in Christian tradition is because of Marcion. Marcion. Many of Marcion's contemporaries had all but forgotten Paul. Wow. Many of Marcion's contemporaries had all but forgotten Paul or subsumed him within the broader apostolic mass. In other words, Paul just kind of faded into the distance. He was just there somewhere. Number four. Christians owe to Marcion the push towards a Christianity rooted in its own distinctive scripture. Oh, wow. You know, we've been saying this for a long time, right? So the scripture of the New Testament church, the, the, the book of Acts church was not the New Testament. We, we, we've been saying this for how long now? I can't, even, I can't even think of how long we've been saying this. The New Testament church, as our uh, good brother Alan would, uh, would say, the New Testament church didn't have two things. They didn't have a church and they didn't have the New Testament. So the only scripture they had was the quote unquote Old Testament. Again, I hate calling it Old Testament. Tanakh. The Law and the Prophets and the Holy Scriptures, the writings. That's all they had. That's all Jesus had. That's all the 12 disciples had. That's all the, the, the church had in the first century. They didn't have the New Testament. It was Marcion you know, who brought the New Testament to fruition and prominence. Christians owe to Marcion a push towards a Christianity rooted in its own distinctive scripture. It should never have been. should never have been. Because this is not WWJD. This is not what Peter and James or John would do. This is not what the, new, the book of Acts church. They didn't have their own distinctive scripture. This is Marcion. This is Marcionite, Marcionistic stuff. Marcionism. So Christians own a Marcion, the, the push towards a Christianity rooted in its own distinctive scripture rather than in an oral tradition of interpreting Jewish scripture. Well, we need to get back to the way it should be, right? We need to get back to the way it should be. We need to get back to the way it was in the days of Yeshua, in the, in the days of, you know, Book of Acts, Book of Acts, chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, pre-Paul. We need to get back to the, to the way it was pre-Marcion. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say pre-Paul, pre-Marcion. Because even Paul, again, according to Dr. Bernoulli here, even Paul, when he was in existence and he wrote his letters and such like that, it was, wasn't really considered to be authoritative or anything like that. It was just someone who faded into the distance until Marcion came around and boom. All of a sudden, Paul became the man. Christians owe to Marcion the push towards a Christianity rooted in its own distinctive scripture rather than an oral tradition of interpreting Jewish scripture or in a scriptureless system of authority and practice like most Greco-Roman religions of the time. Despite Harnack's positive appraisal of Marcion's achievement, he was willing to accept the accusation of Marcion's enemies, such as Tertullian and Epiphanius, that Marcion had edited his biblical texts to make them conform to his views. That is a no-no. That is a no-no. That is a no-no. The lying pen of the scribes. Marcion had edited his biblical text to make them conform to his views. And I believe that is probably, I, I, again, I, I can't say this with 100% certainty, but I'm pretty sure this is what um, Dr. Robert Price would say as well, that either Marcion highly or heavily edited the book of Galatians or he wrote it himself or something to that effect. But Marcion had edited his biblical text to make them conform to his views. What, was, what were his views? Anti-Torah, anti-Jewish, and <laughs> anti-Old Testament. Get rid of it. We got our own scripture. We don't, go, we don't go by the Old Testament anymore. Really? No, I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy into Marcionism. In doing so, Harnock made a fundamental error of historical judgment. First, toward... Tertullian and his associates in this charge against Marcion were working from an anti-Marcionite bias 
that shapes their assumptions. They were unable to quote Marcin himself saying anything about editing or for that matter, correcting, purifying or restoring texts. Second, they were writing from a position in time that makes it impossible for them to have any sure knowledge of the state of anything like the New Testament canon or its constituent books at the time of Marcion. Third, we know for a fact that several of their assumptions are incorrect. There was no existing New Testament canon from which Marcion rejected parts unsuited to him. There was no larger Pauline corpus from which Marcion excised the pastoral letters, that is 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. There was no universal, undisputed orthodoxy from which Marcion diverged. All of these are anachronisms the Marcion's later critics project back into the circumstances of his activity. Fourth, and finally, the content of the texts included in Marcion's New Testament does not show signs that they were edited to conform with Marcion's ideology. Okay, so Dr. Badoon doesn't buy that idea that Marcion edited the text. I do know that there are many scholars that do. Uh, whatever the case is, there's a consensus here that Marcion was the one who was responsible for the idea of a New Testament slash Old Testament, the idea of Gospels and Paul's letters to be put in the, in the New Testament, and the idea of elevating that New Testament to the point of authoritative scripture. The importance of Marcion's New Testament. Once we recognize the baseless character of the suspicions about Marcion as a collector of Christian texts, we can restore him to his proper place as a very early witness to those texts. The oldest relative complete New Testament manuscripts date to the first half of the fourth century. Wow. Incomplete portions of earlier New Testament collections survive in fragmentary papyri from about a century earlier, early third century. The reconstructions called from the quotations of early Christian writers can be pushed back about as far. It is largely on the basis of these sources that the modern New Testament is edited and translated. I'll say that again. It is largely on the basis of these sources that the modern New Testament is edited and translated. But Marcion's New Testament, reconstructable to the same degree as those early 3rd century manuscripts and sources, dates back another century earlier to the mid second century, which is within a generation or two of the original composition of the text themselves. In fact, given his dates, Marcion joins the ranks of the so-called apostolic fathers as a witness to the very earliest recoverable forms of New Testament texts. Yet, because he did not merely make occasional quotations from or allusions to their content as other apostolic fathers did, but compiled and disseminated complete editions of them, Marcion far exceeds such other early witnesses in the extent of evidence he provides for the state of New Testament texts in that time. Freed from the cloud of suspicion, Marcion's New Testament texts have the potential to solve problems that have long plagued text criticism of the New Testament. They can act as a securely datable check on proposals of interpolation or redaction history and perhaps oblige us to reconsider what is or is not the authentic voice of quote unquote Luke or Paul. A couple of interesting examples illustrate this. Marcion's Evangelion had no birth story, no genealogy, and no account of Jesus being baptized by John or tempted by the devil. Instead, it began as follows. In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, when Pilate was governing Syria, Jesus came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them, and they were amazed at his teaching because his speech was delivered authoritatively. Now, let, let me just, I, I gotta say this. This is, this is amazing. Because you look at the Gospel of Mark and the Epistles of Paul were all written before Matthew and Luke. Why didn't they talk about the virgin birth? Why didn't they talk about the, the, the birth of Jesus at all? Why is it that Mark, the epistles of Paul, and Marcion's edition here of the New Testament did not include 
any of that stuff. The earliest writings did not have the virgin birth in it. Or the genealogy of Jesus even. Now Matthew comes out with the genealogy of Jesus, but Luke contradicts him. I know, I know, the, you know, the whole excuse, which I don't think has any basis whatsoever. Luke talks about the genealogy of Mary, whereas Matthew talks about the genealogy of Joseph. Oh, really? Luke talks about the genealogy of Mary? Really? Then why does it say it's the genealogy of Joseph? I'm just not one in favor of shaving down the corners of the square peg to make it fit the round hole. I just don't like that. But it's interesting, right? I mean, not even Marcin himself included the story of the, the birth story, the virgin birth, genealogy, not even the baptism. Does the Gospel of Mark include the baptism? And the Lord's Prayer appeared in a much simpler form with some intriguing differences from the more familiar version. This is what Marcion's version says, right? It says, then he said to them, whenever you may invoke, say, Father, let your sacred spirit come upon us. Let your realm come. Give us your sustaining bread day by day and dismiss us our faults and do not permit us to be brought to trial. In the Apostolicon, Paul's letters to the Romans was considerably shorter. Hmm. There you go. So, in other words, the earliest text, which would have been, would have been from Marcion, or the earlier text, had a shorter book of Romans. So what happened? D Badoon seems to kind of slump to not like the idea that Marcion edited it, but somebody did. Was Paul's original letter to the Romans actually like Marcion? Like was Mar Did Marcion have the, you know, a true copy of the original? And if he did, that means that somewhere down the line through the centuries, someone added a lot somewhere. Someone added stuff to it. Paul's letter to the Romans was considerably shorter, and the famous Christ hymn in his letter to the Colossians lacked a crucial controversial element found in the later versions of the letter. Jesus is, quote, an image of the unseen God before all, the head of the body of the assembly, firstborn from the dead, unquote. But he is not the firstborn of all creation. Ah, it does make more sense to leave that out. I mean, I'm just saying, because what does the firstborn of all creation mean? I mean, let's be honest. What does that mean? You can say he was the firstborn of God or the firstborn. That would make more sense. But the firstborn of all creation, by means of whom all things were created in the heavens and upon the earth, the latter idea of Christ as creator found nowhere else in Paul's letters and likewise not found in Marcion's text of Colossians. Oh, so Paul's letters didn't have the idea of Christ being creator in there. Neither did Marcion's text, but again, what happened? Why is it now that it's in there? Who put it in there? Or who took it out? Which way do you want to look at it? The glass is half full or the glass is half empty. Somebody either took it out or put it in. What happened? But if Marcion did not edit these texts, why are they different from the more familiar versions found in modern Bibles? I think the answer regarding the differences between the Evangelion and Luke is clear. These two alternate versions of the gospel have been tailored, perhaps by the original author, for separate Jewish, Luke, and Gentile, Evangelion, audiences. Isn't that an amazing thought? They were edited to be more appealing to either the Gentiles and or the Jews. Let me say this again. These two alternate versions of the gospel have been tailored, perhaps by the original, perhaps by the original author. That's a big statement. Like the original, quote-unquote, Luke actually thought, I'll make two Gospels here. One, well, I'll tailor this to the, to the Jews. And the other one, I'll tailor this to the Gentiles. In other words, their differences served a practical purpose in the two mission fields, which later hardened into distinct religious communities. The answer may be similar with regard to Paul's letters. That is, the different versions do not reflect significant ideological differences. But... In this case, I suspect that we are dealing not so much with two clearly defined editions, 
but with a more fluid history of compiling the letters from bits and pieces of Paul's correspondence with the possibility of non-Pauline's interpolation with the possibility of non-Pauline or non-Pauline interpret interpolations being introduced into some of the copies in circulation. So here we got Dr. Bernoulli saying he believes that somebody down the line somewhere messed with Paul's text, added to it. Interpolations. These answers will need to be tested. Good idea. And the full significance of the variant readings of Marcion's copies of the text explored further in research still to come. Marcion's act of canonization appears to have served a catalyst for discussions and debates about which Christian writings should be accorded this status. Arguments were made, new sources were sought out, and lists were drawn up. But the process went on for another 200 years before any of the proposed canons matched what modern Christians consider to be the New Testament. Wow. Again, my question to these people, especially people who believe that the Bible is so perfect and all that kind of stuff, is like, if God did it this way, I mean, I, I didn't get anything out of Badoon's, Mr. Badoon's letter here that, that even Marcin himself claimed to be inspired of God in, in including Paul's epistles in the first New Testament. So it's like, so why did God wait 300, 400, 500 years how many thousands and millions or whoever, how many how many people d lived and died in that period of time with with no concrete new testament and why would god do that if indeed he did do that any talk of a new testament apart from marcion's in the second and third centuries is anachronistic and must be treated as a shorthand way to refer to individual books or subsets of texts recognized as authoritative and mid an indeterminate larger set of Christian literature. By issuing a delimited set of Christian texts considered exclusively authoritative as early as the mid-2nd century, Marcion was far ahead of his time, yet ultimately he had a profound influence on Christianity becoming a religion of the book. And there are your notes, your sources, and works cited by Dr. Jason Badoon himself.